Um, welcome and thank you for joining us for another episode of the Jane Irrigation Training Series. I'm your host, Richard Rastusha, and today we're going to be talking about how to select the correct size tubing for your job. Now, let me tell you why I think this is important. I can't tell you how many people I have uh, worked with that uh, have said, Rich, I, you know, I'm getting low pressure. I'm not getting enough water out of my emitters. And, and really, when, when I go look at these jobs, I see a lot of times what they've done is they've selected the wrong size tubing. Maybe they were trying to be economic. I'm not sure what the reasons always are, but um, choosing or selecting the wrong size tubing has, uh, has caused them a lot of problems down the road. And uh, we certainly know that um, it's tough enough to find the time and money to do a job right the first time. Having to do it two or three times just uh, is really impossible. So today we're really fortunate because we've got Michael Pippen back. And uh, Michael's one of my favorite uh, instructors that we have here. You know, uh, Michael's entire career uh, of work and uh, even family life has been in agriculture. He's worked for uh, dealers. He's worked for a manufacturer, Jane, and uh, he's our business development manager at uh, Jane Irrigation. And uh, Michael does a lot of work with the Irrigation Association, has a lot of professional certifications, but most importantly, he's got a passion for irrigation and uh, agriculture that is really unmatched. So uh, Michael, thanks for joining us today. Uh, we really appreciate you taking time to uh, help us solve what uh, has been uh, somewhat of a complex problem. But before we get into that, you know, yesterday was the start of summer, the official start of summer, but uh, everybody's been out working in the fields long before yesterday. Uh, I'd say we're maybe about halfway through a good portion of the season. Uh, how's it going out there? Uh, pr pretty good. It is an interesting time of the season, right? You, you don't get a whole lot of phone calls this time of the year telling you congratulations. It's usually um, <laughs> something's broke, something's blown up, I need it tomorrow type of time of the year. So it really is a very um, solutions-based time of the year, right? We're looking for repairs. We're trying to keep things going, trying to make decisions on, you know, is it too late to flush these lines? Do we need to put additives in there? Do we need to add fertilizer? Do we make a run for it and call it good? We got two weeks to go. So um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a little bit of an intense time of the year. Um, but uh, so far production, I think has been pretty well done, you know, pretty, done pretty good. Some of the markets aren't as strong as we'd like them to be. Um, but overall, most of the regions that I cover have done pretty well. Some of the commodities are a little bit challenging, but they're still a little bit early there. So we've got some room to to, to work on some of that, but but so far I would say it's it's pretty good, a pretty pretty good start to the season, or uh, um, for sure here in the southeast. Well, that, that's really good to hear because you know I just think about the heat that we've seen, especially in the last few weeks, yeah. and uh, it's been warmer in general. The west uh, very short of water, and we've got this heat, so uh, that's good. I, I'm glad uh, most people are having a good season. Yeah, you, you're you're right. It is a little bit warmer than than normal for this time of the year. Uh, so we'll see how that how that plays out. But uh, yeah, I, I would say that I think t to date, everybody kind of take what we've gotten so far. Yeah. So, all right. Well, listen, I'm really curious how uh, you go through uh, your steps to figure out the uh, select, uh, how to select the correct size tubing for a job. Yeah. And I think that there's, you know, there's a couple of ways that you can attack, uh, attack this kind of problem. But from a design standpoint, I feel like um, I, I kind of like to start at some some known information and kind of back into things to try to find the best possible solution. Because any kind of design, uh, there's going to be more than one solution, um, and there'll be opinions on which one is the best. Uh, so, so you want to make sure you're not eliminating some some options first first on right. That you want to make sure you have a good understanding of the options are uh, so you can make a selection towards the end, not eliminate things too early. So when I think, especially for pipeline design, you, you, this can get pretty complex. We're not going to go way down the weeds today. We're going to keep things at a, at a pretty high level so that you have a good understanding of the methodology, what the important criteria are uh, to select a pipe, but then maybe take one little step further, which I think is probably the most important and maybe even the more difficult is the specification of a product. So, because you can definitely design a product that doesn't exist, or you can design a product uh, or make a specification. I would say that's probably a better way of saying you can make a specification of a product that is not available in your market, or maybe it's really expensive, or maybe your dealer doesn't support that. So, you know, just getting the design part is an important piece of the pie, but it's not everything, right? The, the, the actual 
uh, selection of the product uh, is more than just picking out the absolute perfect product for the application. Um, kind of where I usually get started is I, I like to start out in the field. Some people will start in different places, but I kind of have a, a target specification that is known and kind of start working back towards the specification we're looking for. And I, and especially when you start talking about pipeline design, you know, I think the first thing to consider is what is your recommended operational pressure for your device? So where we're going to start thinking of our brain is having one device, whether that's a sprinkler or a dripper or a sprayer or whatever that is, what is the optimal operating pressure for that device? We know that there's going to be some devices that are going to be a little bit higher than at optimal. We know there's going to be some that are going to be a little bit lower, and then some that are going to be right at it. But where is our target? What are we trying to get to? And kind of in this scenario, I like to start thinking, let's just say 30 PSI. That's a pretty general pressure. It's going to work for most drippers and sprayers and, you know, jets and all that kind of stuff. You know, 30 PSI would be our target pressure. They also can have a range. Some devices have a wider range than others, but we're going to again kind of think of it a little bit simpler terms and just say, what's our target pressure? So that's the number one piece of information that I'm going to ask for when I'm trying to figure out the pipeline is what are we, what is our target pressure? What are we trying to do? Then I'm going to say, okay, what do I have? Again, you can really make this a complicated, you know, discussion on what kind of pressure is provided. But for today, we're going to say we're going to have a steady inlet pressure in this case, 40 PSI. So we need 30, we got 40, all right? So that difference in pressure is real, that's allowed between 30 and 40 is really what's gonna drive our pipeline decisions. Uh, so we need to know what our target is. We need to know what we have to start with. And we also kind of need to know what's going on on that pipeline. How many devices do we have? What's our flow rate? Right. Do we have one of these sprinklers? Is it a five gallon a minute sprinkler that needs 35 PSI? Do you have one? Do you have 10? Do you have 100? What do you have? And then also, where are they located on that pipeline? Are they all at the very end, a thousand feet away? Are they spaced evenly across that pipeline? What does that look like? Um, and in kind of these initial discussions, I want us to just think about an inlet pressure of 40 a required pressure of 30, one singular device at a certain distance away. That's kind of where we're going to start this conversation. I think that's the basic information you need to start designing a pipeline. Yes. Yeah, so I, uh, I have a couple of questions though, and I want to remind everybody, I do have the Q and a open. If you have questions, please ask them uh, comments, put in the chat. We have been rewarding people for good, uh, good questions with uh, Jane irrigation training series uh, t-shirts. Uh, but uh, my God, I wanted, you know, in, in landscape, I've never seen a situation where we couldn't get at least 40 PSI. Mm -hmm. We always had to reduce, but I think in ag, uh, quite potentially, there's times when you don't even have 30 PSI. Is that right? That, that's absolutely correct. And that's not necessarily a good thing, right? I mean, sometimes we're adding booster pumps. We're trying to, yeah, it's a great point. We, this, this target pressure could be below, you know, the, the uh, system pressure that's given could be below what our operational pressure or recommend target is. So, you know, we might be adding devices in or we might be taking pressure away. Uh, in most of your landscape applications, yeah, you're going to have 35, 40, 45 PSI. That's what you're going to see. That's what the city is going to provide you or the municipality is going to provide you because that's what your showers and dishwashers and all that kind of stuff like to operate at. And so, so you're going to have kind of this baseline entry point. But on an ag system, we have a lot of times have a lot more control. Like we would might actually, um, you know, be able to have some input on what that pressure is that we get. You know, we may be able to size the pump. We may be able to... Um, put some variable drives and do some things there. So it's a little bit more dynamic in a lot of the larger ag systems. And even, I just say larger systems in general, whether it's a large uh, municipal, you know, a, a landscape project or a golf course or a large ag field, that inlet pressure, you're gonna have a lot more, um, a lot more control over that in most scenarios, whether increasing it or decreasing it as needed. Yeah, okay. And then uh, I also, <laughs> I hate to ask all these questions right off the bat, but uh, I also think at times we can reduce the pressure, not at the valve, but somewhere else. Is that right? That's right. Um, you can reduce it at the valve. You can reduce it out in the field with a pressure regulator, or again, in some of our ag systems, 
uh, what will kind of be a nice transition to our next slide is um, we use the pipeline to help us dial the pressure in to what we want, right? That's a very efficient way of, of doing it that keeps you from buying a secondary device. We know our inlet pressure, we know our target pressure, and so we can design a pipeline that um, it can't increase the pressure. We'll talk about that a little bit, uh, but it could act as the, the device that decreases the pressure. It's a very efficient way of designing a system it keeps you from having another mechanical piece of equipment out there. So it's a cost saver oftentimes, and also just one less thing to manage. So there's yeah. a couple of ways that you can do that. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, looking forward to seeing that. So, so let's, let, I'm going to beg everybody to hang with me here for a second, right? We're going to bring out the algebra for very quickly, not very long, but I think it will help us kind of what, what the goal here of looking at this is, is to try to understand what drives this pressure loss. The pressure loss, that allowable pressure between what we have and what we need is what drives that pipeline design primarily, right? There's other considerations depending on the complexity of the system, but that's the big driver. Here's what I got. Here's what I need. How much pressure can I give up in between that period of time? So hang with me for a second. This is not going to get too deep. First thing we're going to do on that equation, we're going to take all that junk off the front. That's constants that make all the equation work out. Now forget about that. And for this slide, we're gonna forget about the back piece too. Don't worry about that. I want you to concentrate here right in the middle of that middle part of the equation, the Q over D. We're also gonna forget about those, those exponents. Don't worry about that. They're important, but not for this discussion. What we're really gonna focus on is that Q over D, all right? So this HF, that is that allowable pressure. That's the friction loss between what you have and what you need. So it's the allowed, how much we got to play with right there. That's what that HF means. It's a friction loss in that pipeline. The Q is your flow rate. The D is the size of your pipe, the diameter of your pipe. So if you take all the stuff away, which is important and helps our calculations, what you're looking at this relationship of your friction loss is related, you know, what's driving that decision. It's the flow rate and the diameter. Two of the things that I said, we, you know, we need to know. We need to know this differential and we need to know this flow rate. What I want you to see here over here on the left-hand side, I've simplified that this friction loss is your flow rate over your diameter. That's the relationship. So I'm going to make these numbers up. These numbers don't mean anything. But if your flow rate was 10 and your diameter was 2, imaginary numbers, 10 and 2, then your friction loss would be a 5, right? But what happens if I increase my flow rate? Go from 10 to 20 on this cube but I keep my pipe size the same. Flow rate has gone up, pipe stays the same. What happens? Our pressure loss goes up. So I'm gonna say that again. Flow rate goes up, pipe stays the same. This allowable pressure, you're gonna start eating some more pressure up, right? Because the flow rate has increased. Now here's the one that is the most common misconception in pipeline design. You got your friction, We've kept our flow rate the same. See, it's 10 here and 10 here. But what I did was I decreased my pipe size. I went from two to one. What happens? Our friction loss goes up. I know that a lot of us have heard. I've heard it from designers. I've heard it from contractors. I've heard it from installers. Man, I, I need that little pressure at the end. So I neck that pipe down to boost that pressure up right there at the end. I think a lot of us have heard that. That is absolutely Incorrect. Decreasing the pipe size, if your flow rate stays the same, will decrease the pressure in that line. It will increase the friction loss. It will not boost that pressure on up. It will bring that pressure on down. What they're alluding to is they see these nozzles like you spray around your house and think that is pressure. That is velocity. That's a whole different, whole different webinar. Your, your pipeline, if you reduce that pipe, you're going to use up more pressure. So it does not increase pressure. So what I want, that's, the, that's what I want you to take away from this slide. Pipe stays the same, but flow rate goes up. That means you're going to eat up more pressure. If your flow rate stays the same and you bring your pipe down, you're going to increase your, your pressure loss, right? So th that's the two ways. That's that relationship right there. You know where I see that um, most uh, example the most for me is uh, when I'm filling up my uh, water bucket and I'm going to hand water. If I leave the hose end sprayer on and use the sprayer, 
boy, it seems like it's really coming out fast, but it takes longer to fill up my bucket than if I just oh, take it off and fill it up with uh, yeah, with my half inch or five eighths inch hose. So uh, it's it's they, intuitively it doesn't make sense, but uh, but there it is. It's a little counterintuitive, right? You're see what you're seeing coming out of that nozzle is not pressure; it's velocity. So it's a little bit. You know, again, we're getting a little bit of weeds there. We're going to move on before we lose the crowd. But, but that's, I think that's an important, I think that's important, uh, you know, important conceptually to see how this equation, the, 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 uh, the, really the dynamics really work. So well, you, we take, you just got a very, a little bit. you got a very nice comment in the comment section where it said, finally, someone clever killing the myth. So, <laughs> that, right. That's right. So I want to address this last section of the, of, the, of the equation, which is a little more intuitive, the length. So we forgot about all these constants making all the math work. We forgot about this relationship that we just uh, worked through, and we're going to look just at this lengthy part, length part of the equation. So you've got, again, we've got friction over here, this allowable pressure here on the very front. If we, again, make, we're making up units, these units don't mean anything, but just give you a relationship. If we do a length of 100 over 100, that's one. But what happens if I increase the length to 200? Then my friction loss, again, increases. I, I see a mistake here. This is, I have L, this should be that HF again. Sorry about that. Uh, but if you increase your length, you're going to increase your friction loss, right? So that's the relationship. And I think a lot of people, that is intuitive to people. You've seen that, you take that garden hose example. You put one garden hose on there, you fill up the bucket, it takes three minutes. You put two garden hoses on there, eh, it took four minutes. What happened there? We used up some of that energy because we had more pipeline to get that through. So I think the length part is very intuitive. Some of the diameter and the flow rate is a little less intuitive. So here we go. Last equation on the slide on the equation. Hang with me here. We we're going to get somewhere. Again, we're going to forget about that constant part. Forget about it. Don't worry about it. If you remember the first slide, what is the information that I need to figure out my diameter of my pipe? In this equation, that's the D. So I said the first thing I want to know is my target pressure, right? 40 PSI or 30 PSI. What do I have coming in? 40 PSI. That's the friction loss that I have to work with, right? That's that part of the equation. That's the friction loss. So I need to know that information. What else do I need to know? I need to know how many devices do I have? One, two, 10, whatever, right? What's my flow rate of my system? That's the Q. I need to know that. I need to know where you're at on the system. Is, is it all a thousand yards away or is it all right there in the flower bed? I need to know this length. What am I left with? Left with the diameter of the pipe. So that's a lot of words, but it, I think it gives you a, a good real idea of what the critical components are that you have to know to be able to accurately size a pipe. And if we had to, um, and we really wanted to, which we don't, uh, we could take some systems and we could grind these equations out and you could figure out exactly the pipe size that you need and how to take it down, regardless of how many outlets you have um, or, or uh, how complicated the system is. This, this equation always works. Um, it, but lucky for us, we have some tools that will help us make these decisions, just like we have tools that help us do all the other work that we do, whether it's in the yard or on the car or, or in the irrigation system, we have some tools that make our life a little bit easier. And that's kind of what we're gonna talk about next. Now that we kind of have that baseline, I'm gonna tell you what we can do to actually make these decisions. So, so Mike, we had one uh, other question here, and it was on the flow rate. And somebody wants to know if uh, if calculating the flow rate is just as easy as saying, okay, I've got 20 emitters on this line, and they're a gallon each, so my flow rate is 20 gallons per hour. Um, it can be. Um, oftentimes, it's not. Uh, we don't always get that fortunate, right? And and here, that's a that's a great question to kind of transition us into what we're going to see here. Um, if they were all very close to each other, though, all those outlets, I mean, really close within a few feet, um, or they were at the exact location, then that would be the question. That would be exactly right. Um, because you're going to have the same amount of flow across that whole pipeline difference. But if you have a dripper every four feet, and the dripper line is 500 feet long, then obviously 
the flow rate is going to change as you go down that line because on the front end you're going to have all of them then you're going to be all of them minus one all of them minus two all of them minus three and that's when you start going oh that equation starts being a little bit cumbersome right yeah. you can take that equation and do all those calculations and it works thankful for us uh, people have done that for us and made some nice charts and that's what we're going to look at look at here um you, you can get some middle ground up here in the top right is where they figured out this friction loss per hundred foot. We're going to look at polyethylene tubing right here, like blank half inch, three quarter, one inch tubing. Um, and this would answer the question of that allowable friction loss, right? So I'm going to, yeah, look at there, circle popped up where I wanted it to. Um, in the previous example, or the only example, we had 30 as our target, 40 is what we started with. So our allowable friction loss was 10 PSI. That's how much we could play with, right? This chart is giving us pressure loss per 100 feet. Yeah. So if our device, our singular device that needed that 10 PSI differential was 100 feet away, you could look down here and say, okay, here's, and it's five gallons a minute. Here's your flow rate, five gallons a minute. You move over here and you go, oh, our pressure loss is 9.6. 9.6 is less than 10. You are correct, right? Our allowed was 10, 40 to 30. But like a lot of charts, the colors kind of mean something. Like the yellow kind of means you're starting to get dangerous. We're going to call this red. That's not where we want to be. It's marginal, right? So that would be a good scenario where I'd say, okay, yes, technically, half inch would work in that scenario because the pressure loss is less than 10. But man, that's really close, right? That's really close. What if you're, you, you guessed and it wasn't really 100, it was really like 120 feet or 150 feet, or maybe the flow rate was 5.25, right? You don't have any wiggle room right here. So half inch is not great selection. You move up to three quarter inch and you're only using two and a half PSI. You've got 10 to play with. Man, you can do all kinds of stuff. Your measurements don't have to be that great. Um, they can be pretty close. Your flow rate can be a little bit higher, a little bit lower. Maybe you don't quite have 40. Maybe we round it up. Maybe we only have 38, right? In this scenario, three-quarter inch would work really nicely. And so that's when I say you kind of start trying to figure out you got some options here. Half inch would not be a wrong selection with the information I've given you. But, man, it's close. Your calculations ought to be really tight. Sometimes we have to do that. Sometimes we don't. So this chart has answered the question of instead of doing all those calculations, I've got my flow rate, I know my distance, what's my pressure loss per 100 feet? And so then you can figure out how far you could run that. And that, that's how this chart works. It's a really popular way to do mainline pipeline design where you do have just like um, a single outlet, right? This chart is very helpful, not quite as helpful if you have a bunch of emitters on one stringed out line. If you go to the chart below it, another circle drops up. Here kind of takes the next step to answer your question. What if I have a whole bunch of emitters or a whole bunch of sprinklers or a whole bunch of jets? What happens if there's a whole bunch of them on a line? And man, I don't want to figure out. You could take this chart up here and figure out the friction loss in between each one of them. But what if your drippers were every four feet apart? Man, that starts being a pain big time, right? Well, we've done this calculation for you as well. You got a one gallon per hour dripper. You're going to punch one in every 48 inches. How far can I run with a half inch tubing? And the answer here is 900 feet. Wow. Right. So we've done these calculations for you. But you can see, again, I think the under, understanding kind of what drives that information, um, you can see how to make better, better choices. Um, what if the flow rate goes up? Right. So you're not using a one gallon per hour. You're using a two gallon per hour. Everything else is the same. Now, we can't run 900 feet anymore because our flow rate has increased. So, therefore, our friction loss has increased. We can't run 900 feet. We can only run 600 feet, 700 feet, something like that. And, again, I'd say the same thing is, like, if, you're, if your line is exactly 900 feet and if your pressure is exactly 30, then you really might consider on moving up to a larger pipe size, right? These charts are, are available for most applications, most products. Um, and they're usually accurate enough. 
Um, if you're running a small system design, then, then you know, whatever, five, ten acres or a landscape design, they're probably perfectly su su sufficient. If you're designing a 300-acre uh, blueberry field, then, then you probably need to do something a little bit more advanced than this. This gets you in the right ballpark, so you kind of start thinking about what the system would look like. But, you know, these charts are guidelines. They're accurate enough and available for most applications to give you a tool to get you in the right place, but they're not they're not a substitution for like, for example, a cute computer model uh, that you can put in the different pipe size, change flow rates, and get an absolute to the nth degree uh, answer on your friction loss and length. That computer model is gonna use that crazy equation that we looked at the slide before, and it's gonna put in all the variables, and it's gonna do all the math for you, and it's gonna say, this is your friction loss. So those are available for, for, um, for, for larger designs. But again, when you start looking at some of these these design criteria, when you're making these selections, making these recommendations, you know you should be thinking about, you know, what what's the chance of this gonna that this system's gonna expand, right? You're gonna like again this example here. You go 900 feet. Well, I've got 900 feet. Uh, ask the nursery grower. Say, well, are you planning on expanding on this? He said, oh yeah, yeah. Um, I've only got 900 feet worth of plants because that's all that they could give us this year. As soon as I get the my shade cloth in, I'm gonna plant another 200 feet on the end of this. Well, that seven, that this tubing right here would be a poor selection in that case, right? You would want to do a, do a larger size. So what kind of expansion um, ideas do they have? As a designer, I would always say, what do you think might happen in the next three to five years? I think that's reasonable. I think everybody kind of has their own gauge there. I said, you know, if it's happening in the next three to five years, you probably have a pretty good feel for what your plan is. Um, and it's reasonable, I think, to try to design for something in the next three to five years. If you start trying to design for the next 20 years, man, there's a lot of gray area there. Like that can really, you can oftentimes over design, make an overly expensive system if, um, if you try to look too far out in advance. There's just too many unknowns. So for me, I would always say three to five years. Let's plan for three to five years. You know, if you have something that you really know you're going to do in seven years, that's up to you, right? But, but you know, start trying to plan for 10, 20 years out. I think that's really difficult in most systems um, in terms of, like, expansion and those kind of things. I, I also like to look at size consistency. We'll hit on that briefly. Um, but there's a lot of different sizes of stuff. So, you know, again, you look at this system here. If your whole – all every property on your whole place is 0 0.72 tubing – but this one, you could probably get away with 0.62. I would talk to the grower or the producer pretty heavily about staying with 0.72 tubing, right? Is there that much cost difference for you to justify having a second size pipe out in your field? Maybe. You know, I don't know your I don't know the grower's price points. If it's a couple hundred dollars, maybe not. If it's a couple thousand, probably so. But those things, I, I like to keep things as consistent as I can. You go out to the field, have one size coupler, you know, one size pipe. That That's really a simple, that thing, that's a, an overlooked design criteria. And then also we talked a little bit earlier about specifying a product that your dealer doesn't have, right? That happens more often than we would like it to from a designer standpoint. You have, a, you know, us manufacturers have these great catalogs with a thousand items in there. Man, we really only build five of them regularly, right? And so, you know, making sure you're specifying one that we're gonna be able to get, offer you a good competitive price at is really important. Doesn't do us a whole lot of good to specify a one-off product that only gets run three times a year and you have to order 10 million feet to get it run, right? So I think that's something as a designer as well. Let's get us in the right ballpark and then start opening our opinions on what what is what is more readily available and more commonplace in the marketplace. Yes, so uh, we have a question here about this maximum run length chart. Where, where can somebody find this? Um, most of the time you will find it in design guides or product uh, application guides, not as much in like the actual like cut sheets for products. So in our case, um, on our website, jainsusa.com, jainsusa.com, we have a resource tab. And this chart here that I'm showing uh, with a run length, maximum run length on feet, that's in our, actually in our greenhouse calculator, our greenhouse guide. It's about 15 page design guide um, because that's where a lot of um, greenhouse nurseries do a lot of these punch in emitters. And that's what this example is showing as our, as our click tip dripper punched in on a, on a pipeline. So that's where that product line is. This friction loss chart um, is much more universal, right? This is, this is just math. And so um, you can find them, you know, you can Google friction loss 
on polyethylene. You can find them all over Google. This one is actually in our catalog. We put a, some technical information, some generic technical information in the background. We have one. I think we even have PVC pipe in the background. So this is a, you know, a, a, a pretty well understood standard design where, where this one, the maximum run length, is more of information that we've developed specific to our products. Not that it doesn't apply in general terms to anybody's punch in dripper on their tubing, but it is specific to us. So you could t see, you know, some some um, discrepancies if you use this chart with somebody else's products. So. Yeah, no, and I really like your points that you made, you know, uh, um, add your insurance, you may be uh, adding some extra feet in the future. So start with the end in mind, five to three to five years out. And then uh, uh, I, I thought that was really uh, uh, good advice. Yeah, and everybody kind of has their own um, their own guide there that they've had that they've learned from experience. But I do think kind of that this is where I allude to from the very first slide, the intro. You know, sometimes designing the product is easier than specifying it. And what's the difference? Well, you know, I can design, I can use the equation, I can sit down, and man, I can design a different segment for each one of your emitters on that thousand nine hundred foot run. Is that practical? Is that being a good designer? I would say probably not. Uh, an accurate designer, uh, but maybe not a good designer. Um, it would take you forever to get it done. It would be over-engineered, if you will. Um, and then you probably have some products specified that aren't available. And you can look here at our product guide on tubing. And I show you this to say there are a lot of options. Talk to your dealers. We have qualified designers at the dealer level. If they don't know what products are available, that's why Richard and I are here. We can help put them in a right product. If you're buying 10 million feet, we'll make anything you want. Um, if you're buying 10,000 feet or 1,000 feet, you know, it's very, as, a, as a designer, you need to keep a mind on the economics of this. A good designer always has one eye on the, on the optimal design and one eye on the economics, right? Give your users um or your growers those options you know you may have preferences that cost more i mean that those are all things that you can communicate uh, but don't lose sight of products that are available because i show you this chart and then i'll tell you there's even more than this that we run on a consistent basis um, that are not even in our product guide right because of various reasons costing and and uh, coil diameters and all kinds of things so you know there are a lot of sizes uh you should be able to, as a designer you should be able to find something that works for you um, there are also, you know, we kind of have some, some, um, you know, some nominal terms here. You can look at all the stuff we qualify as half inch tubing. There's three different products in there that we call half inch, right? And so, um, you know, it's important to look at these diameters, these inside out side diameters, talk in true specifics, work with your dealers, understand what they products they support, um, understand the pipe, the, the lines that are going to be on their shelf and stock. And I think that is uh, goes for material components as well. There's vinyl, there's PE, there's all kinds of configurations. They all have unique applications. A lot of them do work in multiple applications, but I, I, I challenge the, the, the designers to, that's when you really, you know, as a good designer, when you start meeting with the dealer, with the manufacturing, specifying products that are at, at the highest quality, at the best price, most available, especially in the current environment that we're in, right? We all know how the supply chains have gotten very tight. So all the stuff that that is not super, super popular, I mean, it's, it's like, like that at the irrigation uh, manufacturers, just like it is at the grocery stores, right? You don't have all the cereal brands you used to have or whatever, right? Uh, hopefully all that comes back in due time. But right now, as a designer staying within, um, what is, is readily available is super important. So that, that's really what I wanted to share about the designing of pipeline, Richard. Um, I do have my contact information there. Um, you know, we can talk in more dealer detail on any of these, you know, um, design topics. Uh, more importantly, I can point you towards resources and people that are a lot better teachers and, and a lot better designers than I am. The IA has a lot of resources. We have a lot of resources out there. And so um, if you do want to reach out to me, I can share some of those links. I can show you where to buy uh, design guides. ITRC also has some really nice pipeline design, uh, pump design, those type of things. I can point you towards those resources. Yeah, what a wealth of information you supplied today, Michael. Um, so generous and nice of you. And I just want to confirm if anybody out there in our audience has a question about 
how do I get the right size? I'm, I'm, maybe I'm on the, uh, the border here. Maybe do I need to go higher? They can email you or call you direct and, and you'll help them out. Certainly. Yeah. They can call me, email, whatever they're most comfortable, text, whatever they want to. If I can't answer it, I'll, I'll get you in touch with somebody that can. We have a, you know, a, a really strong staff here at Jane and then a, a really strong dealer network. So um, if I don't know the answer, I can get you in touch with somebody that does pretty quickly. So yeah, feel free, call, email, text, then no problem. Yeah. And I really thought too, your advice of, uh, uh, you know, see, see what's available too, because uh, oftentimes that's going to be uh, an economic solution as well. And you're always going to be able to get it. And that's really important. Totally agree. totally agree. Yeah. So, well, Michael, thanks so much for being here today and helping us out to all our viewers today. I want to say thank you for spending some of your time uh, today with us. I also want to remind everybody that you can see our almost 200 uh, total trainings now at changeusa.com forward slash trainings or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. I just love that people are out there working listening on their headphones to uh, educate themselves on sustainability and water management. Uh, I think that's really great. It uh, helps get me going every day. So thanks again, Michael. Thanks to all of you. And uh, we'll be back on Friday. Uh, we're going to talk about satellite imaging on Friday combined with tools in the field that uh, really help you become a top-notch water manager. So that's on Friday. Thanks again, Michael. We'll see everybody Friday. Thank you.